Hello, welcome guys. This is my first video of radiology and we will start with the subject vascular intervention. So vascular intervention interventions are part of the intervention radiology and basically it's a procedure conducted from the vasculature uh, with needles, uh, guide wires, cathedrals, uh, which you can uh, promote or demote the blood flow in the vessels. It's usually done under the control of uh, imaging such as x-ray, ultrasound, CT and MRIs and therefore uh, most commonly intervention radiologists uh, perform those interventions but also uh, other specialists do them. Um, the least invasive and most accessible uh, imaging that is used is the duplex ultrasound. However, this is a subjective examination because the quality is inter alia determined by uh, the skill of the investigator and his uh, experience with uh, ultrasound and the physical properties of the patient. So when a patient has a lot of intra-abdominal fat, uh, the quality of the ultrasound is uh, way less. So in practice, ultrasound is usually uh, only used to pierce the blood vessel uh, to uh, do the first step, actually, of your vascular intervention. And afterwards, uh, everything is done under X-ray guidance. And most commonly, uh, Iodine containing contrast is used to uh, make the vessels more visible. It all starts uh, with the Seldinger technique, that is the, the, the first basic steps of the vesicle intervention, and you can see them on the most left picture. First, you seek uh, the vessel with ultrasound, and most commonly, the common femoral artery or the brachial artery are uh, punctured. Then you place your uh, guide wire, which is the second picture, and uh, afterwards you put in a sheet, which is your workstation. And uh, you can uh, enter your cathedral within the sheet. Now there are lots of different cathedrals, lots of different guide wires. They all uh, have different properties. You can see them in the second picture. They uh, can be flexible, they can be stiff, and uh, they're all needed for different situations. Now, one of the most important things is uh, after you plan a vascular intervention with your patient is to prepare the patient well. And a big part about uh, preparing well is to um, ask the patient uh, his renal function, his coagulation status, and if he has any allergies. Um, a patient needs a good kidney function because the kidneys uh, clear the contrast from your blood and this is a very hard job for the kidneys so if the patient has poor kidney status it can compromise uh, the kidney function and you definitely don't want to have that because it will bring lots of complications. So um, if the patient does have poor kidney function you uh, should take additional measures such as uh, prehydration, among others. Then the coagulation status. Uh, it's important to prevent bleeding. So the patient uh, should always have an INR less than 2, but uh, the INR can, uh, can differ because different protocols are used in different hospitals. So sometimes it can be higher or lower, but just remember less than 2, you're always good. So if the patient use uh, blood thinners or uh, something like that, they should be stopped well before the procedure starts to prevent bleeding. And uh, the allergies, uh, patients can have allergies for uh, the contrast use, for uh, bandages, for uh, antibiotics, and you should know that because the patient could uh, get a life-threatening uh, shock and you don't want to have that. So. Uh, if they are, uh, for example, known to have a 
contrast allergy, you need to take uh, additional measures. Give them into, uh, in anti-inflammatory drugs like prednisolone and antihistamines like uh, Tavagil as prophylax to prevent uh, further uh, complications. Now, of all the patients that uh, receive vascular intervention, um, a big part of them have a peripheral vascular disease. So in this presentation, I will focus on what to do uh, when the patients have a peripheral vascular disease. So, uh, as you know, a large part of the population, and certainly a large part of the patient who is eligible for vascular intervention, have a form of uh, peripheral vascular disease, most often in stenosis or an oxidation. Um, in the vessels which uh, compromises the blood flow to your extremities and which can cause ischemic symptoms like pain and uh, etc. Uh, often this is caused by atherosclerosis of the lower extremities which uh, can be caused by many risk factors like smoking, increasing age, diabetes and hypertension for example. Besides atherosclerosis, uh, also thromboembolic processes, vasculitis, compression of the uh, of the limb, can cause these stenoses and oxidations. So we can say that uh, the more severe the stenosis is, the more the severe the oxidation, the less blood gets to uh, your extremities, the more symptoms you have, and uh, the severity of these symptoms can be uh, classified with the Fontaine classification. It, can, uh, it knows four stages and the first one is uh, that your patient is asymptomatic or has non-specific symptoms and during your physical examination you feel cold extremities and weak to no pulse. But uh, this patient is still quite healthy. Then in stage two um, this is called intermittent claudication and then your patient may uh, have pain uh, after walking a certain distance so in 2a it's more than 200 meters and in 2b it's less than 200 meters in stage 3 a patient um, experience rest pain so pain when he isn't even walking and typically this is during night when you lay, because when you lay, the gravity doesn't pull the blood to your extremities. So he has less blood, the patient has less blood in his extremities than when he's standing up, so he has more pain. And there are less uh, stimuli during the night when you're laying in bed than during the day, so the patient focuses more on his pain, and therefore it gets worse. And stage four is the final stage in which the patient uh, experiences is ischemic ulcers or gangrene seen in the picture on the left and uh, by then your uh, yeah the patient has lots of complaints <laughs> as you can imagine and uh, you must treat it by amputation so this brings us to uh, the two most common used uh, uh, treatments for patients with peripheral uh, vascular disease. This can be uh, surgical or PTA, which stands for percutaneous transluminal angioplasty. And um, now, first, let me say when a patient has Fontaine 1 or 2, you always want to treat them conservatively so you want to uh, let them walk and run and um, by walking and running they will make collateral arteries so the blood flow to the extremities um, improves and therefore their complaints will uh, diminish at least you hope because uh, the walking uh, the walking uh, treatment is mostly dependent on the patient himself uh, so he needs to walk he needs to change his way of life 
and you can even promote this with further lifestyle improvements uh, risk factor management so you let them you tell them to quit smoking uh, have a healthy diet and uh, walk more and this will get his vessels quality better this will let him make collaterals and this will uh, when he, he does uh, work hard this will uh, improve his, uh, his symptoms but when this conservative treatment isn't enough and when the patients have too severe complaints you will go to a more invasive treatment which can be the PTA or the sur surgical uh, approach. Um, PTA is yeah, considered uh, non-invasive or not that invasive and um, it's, it's your main, uh, it's one of the main things you do with vascular intervention. So the choice uh, depends on the severity of the symptoms, the Fontaine classification, but also the location of the complaints, the extent of uh, the lesion and the extent of the stenosis, previous treatments and the preference of the patient and the doctors, etc. But uh, for this uh, for this video, we'll mostly uh, talk about PTA. So the average patient who receives PTA has one or multiple stenosis and um, therefore you will get PTA. Um, this can occur on different, these stenosis uh, may be located in different levels between the aorta and the lower leg and therefore the lesions are approached in different ways. Usually uh, the AFC is punctured ipsilateral and hence uh, the sheet is placed towards the lesion. This, mean, this means that uh, an iliacal lesion is assessed uh, retrograde and the femoral or crawl region is assessed anterograde. If the stenosis, however, is too close to the puncture site, then you do not have enough space to uh, enter your sheet or to enter your, um, your wires or your needle. And then uh, you, have to puncture, you have to puncture the AFC contralateral and the sheet uh, is placed retrograde then. You work your way over the bifurcation as you can see uh, in the picture and this is called a crossover. So you start contralateral. So um, imagine it all goes well and uh, you start to um, maneuver yourself closer to the lesion, closer to the stenosis by the use of different uh, wires and different catheters and then uh, you need of course to pass the stenosis and preferably this is done by uh, intraluminal by uh, recanalizing uh, the vessel but uh, by long-standing occlusions it's not always possible to do this and then you have to uh, bring your your guide wire and your uh, your catheter sub -intimal. So you have to bring them in the intima and consciously create a dissection and then you have to uh, put them uh, past the lesion and then you have to re-enter the vessel again. And this procedure is called re-entering. After you're, uh, you're with your, your wires behind the lesion you can uh, put a balloon uh, all the way up till behind the lesion and then put it a bit down and dilatate the balloon. This is called de dilatation and uh, pre-dilatation, I'm sorry. And then you put uh, the plaque, you crush the intima and put the plaque, uh, and you spread it and you, you press it very hard in the wall of the vessel and this can be enough to open the vessel again and to relieve the complaints the patient have has, but it's not in all case, uh, not in all scenarios enough. So you can also choose to place uh, additional uh, an an additional stent, and there are lots of different stents. Some of them uh, use medicine, others don't. But I will not go into that. But you can place a stent which uh, reinforces 
the dilatation and you can even do pulse dilatation so after you place the stent you dilate the balloon again to work away uh, maybe the last uh, vessel uh, stenosis so after all that is done you uh, pull your vessels out you pull your sheet out and um, you compress the artery for 15 minutes till uh, half an hour so it, uh, it closes nicely this whole procedure the whole PTA is done under uh, x-ray exposure or most of the time at least with uh, the use of contrast like we uh, talked about a PTA is uh, minimally invasive but not without risk so there can be complications like a uh, myocardial infect because of the forming of a thromboembolic plaque of thromboembolic uh, complication uh, arrhythmies you can bleed for example from the uh, catheter insertion site there can be infections edema in the bones uh, pulmonary edema because of a thromboembolic uh, complication uh, there can be a rest stenosis uh, scar tissue can uh, can be a problem or, or even nerve damage when you uh, you hit the nerve so that was uh, actually my first uh, the first part about uh, radiology and there will follow another video about uh, intervention radiology. I hope you enjoyed it. If there are any questions, suggestions, improvements, let me know in the comments. Thank you for listening.